of this too. They wanted a piece of the action. Priya Manikchan wanted a piece of the action too. And so Priya Manikchan got involved. She saw this opportunity and guess what she did? She ensured that she got a cut. She wanted a cut out of this thing. She ain't going to allow this actor. I am almost certain she never knew him from Jump Street. I am almost certain she never watched the movie. She doesn't know this guy from Jump Street. But there is something that's so captivating about this guy that drew him to Priya Manikchan and caught Priya Manikchan's attention. Priya Manikchan decided that she is she has other purposes. They indeed got problems with this question about household. We are going to be given. As I suggested on Thursday morning on Camps TV, $100,000 to Guyanese residents, Guyanese adult Guyanese residents. That is easier. Because, first of all, here's the advantages of doing that. One, you got a problem, you don't have to have a problem anymore about defining households. Because a lot of people think a house is a household, is that true? A house is not a household. And you don't go wrong and saying, well, look, I pass the house and so on. Or I, I finish with the house. You might finish with the house. But you don't, You have not finished with the household. The PA generally welcomes the initiatives announced by the president as a baby step forward. We bemoan the fact that taken as a whole, they represent more of an election gimmickry rather than a genuine attempt to address the country's debilitating social and economic problems. Although electioneering is part of political life, any responsible government should ground its stewardship of the country. Welcome back to the flight. Hit that subscription button, buddy, and stay updated with everything that's trending in Guyana and the diaspora. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, the Queen, Miss Global International 2024, Miss Diana. The National Procurement and Tender Administration Board Office revealed that local consultants BAG Consulting have been awarded the contract to conduct the third audit of ExxonMobil's expenses for the period 2021 to 2023. According to details recently released on NPTAB's website, VHG Consulting was awarded the project on October 10, 2024 for the cost of $312,642,834. The audit services is a project being undertaken by the Ministry of Natural Resources who had issued a tender earlier in the year for consulting services for cost recovery audit and validation of the government of Guyana's profit oil share for the period 2021 to 2023. The project was initially opened back in March and VHE was among Grant Thornton UK LLP and PKF Barcelos Narin and Company and M. Sukai and Company in joint venture with InfoWorks Solutions Limited who had submitted bids. According to the Ministry tender document, the terms of reference said the successful consultant is required to conduct a pre-audit analysis, devise an effective audit plan inclusive of an appropriate methodology, execute the audit in adherence to the provisions of the Stabro Block Petroleum Agreement and applicable local laws, regulations and procedures as well as international good practices and standards. The scope of works also includes conducting verifications of the crude oil valuation pursuant to the provisions of the Petroleum Agreement for the audit period as well as verifying royalties remitted to the government for the said period. Additionally, the selected consultant will also be required to validate the accuracy of the total government share of petroleum for the period under review and assessing the impact of the audit on future profit oil revenues. This project marks the third such audit the Guyana government has embarked on. The first audit was done by a British firm, IHS Market for the period 1999 to 2017. That audit examined expenses totaling US dollars and 70 cents B. Auditors had recommended US wool $114 and be contested by the state and while the government has accepted this recommendation, there has been no move to the next step to reclaim the costs. 
Country manager for Exxon Mobil Alistair Rottle has said that the lopsided contract signed with this country is very successful and cautions citizens not to compare Diana's oil terms with those of neighboring Suriname. He was at the time addressing the media last Wednesday at a news conference. Admitting that he has seen the comments made about Suriname's deal in contrast to Diana's Rottle said that everyone wants to say ours is better than yours. But you know at the end of the day all the elements that go into an agreement like this, a production sharing agreement is put together at a point in time reflecting the risk that existed and in order to try and attract investment. He boasted that the current agreement has been very successful for Diana as it has been able to attract investment into a basin where no one had made any discoveries and persons should take a step back to reminisce on that aspect. If the risk the Suriname drilling because discoveries have been made in Diana by the Stabroke block coventurers, and we can always cherry pick that somebody has higher royalty or lower royalty pays this tax or that tax, but it's about the total amount of revenue that's generated out of the petroleum agreement that's really important to the country, Routledge told reporters. Exxon Mobil Country Manager to Guyana Alistair Routledge Exxon Mobil Country Manager to Guyana Alistair Routledge He explained that if sufficient investment is not attracted to a country, development cannot happen hence there would not be the same scale of revenue. So you can have a larger percentage of a small number or you can have maybe a fair share of a much larger number and ultimately that's more meaningful for the country. That's where we have to just be careful about people just writing things and wanting to cherry pick certain numbers. I don't think it's helpful. Ultimately, the analysis that anybody should do which is the agreement delivering value for the country is it attracting the investment that is sought in order to develop the resource. On October 5th, 2020, 2024, the Kaitour News reported that on October 1, 2024, Suriname announced that it has a final investment decision to develop a production field in Block 58 offshore Suriname. The time frame for the construction and installation, according to a release from Statsoli, https colon slash slash www.statsoli.com slash would take approximately four years. Suriname can expect first oil in 2028. In a video clip, the managing director of the state-owned company Statsoli, Anand Jaj Sai, compared the contracts of Diana and Suriname during the announc. Vice President Bharat Jadio. Vice President Bharat Jadio. Amend of the FID. Diana, they have 2% royalty and 50% profit split, no taxes. And here in Suriname, we have like 6.25% royalty, profit split according to a certain formula. So the higher the oil price, the better for Suriname. But the lower the oil price, then the contractor gets protected and we have a stabilized tax rate of 36%. Jage Sar said adding, so you can do the math and the deal is good but of course everybody has to survive in this partnership. Vice President Barat Jagdio at a recent press conference acknowledged that Suriname has better terms in their agreement than Diana's 2016 agreement. Jagdio's statement followed the publication of an article by Demerara Waves headline, Suriname boasts of better oil contract terms than Diana. Jagdio compared Suriname's royalty rates with that of the new public sharing agreement saying that, so if you look at their royalty rate of 6.2% royalty, we have just put in our new PSA, a 10% royalty rate that's the new condition but the agreement that they have today is better than the 2016 agreement and we pointed this out many times. Just 2012, first of all, we don't know what is the government's current definition of household. Correct. Correct. But by the census definition of household, in 2012, and in 2012, that was the last published census, census. report, mm -hmm. there were 210,124 households. Mm -hmm. And that was a 15% growth from 2002, 10 years before. Mm -hmm. So there was a 15% growth over 10 years in the number of households in Guyana. This government refuses to release the census of 2022. We might get some answers from this cash grant. Now, this is where we are now. Based on the numbers released by Ali, you can deduce that he is saying there are 300,000 households. Correct. Mm. Now, if you use the 15% growth from 2002 to 2012, there can only be a maximum of 240, 1,642 households mm -hmm. at the moment. Mm -hmm. For easy conversation, let's round it to 240,000. Don't kill me for 1,000, right? <laughs> 
Now, there should be in the region of 240 households. But Ali says they're two part, paying to 240,000 households. But Ali is saying that they're going to be paying out $200,000 to a total of 300,000 households. Mm -hmm. It means that before this process starts, Ali and company, whoever engineered this thing, have securely set aside $12 billion to pay out to phantom households. <laughs> well, well, Marvin, that's one way of looking at it. But, but there might be um, a slight error in the assumption that you're making. You, you're assuming that there's a uniform increase between uh, 20, um, uh, 2002, 2012, and 2022. Let's assume, let's assume that there's not. Jagdio says they're 264,000. Right. So that figure, we have to assume, comes from the latest census, 264. We haven't seen the census. No. They seem to have access to it, but 264,000. So let us take all those as a given. Let us take that as 264, a given. Yes. and let's look yes. at it for what it's worth. Yeah. And, and and it means that there's a difference still. Up to the 6,000. Up to the 6,000. So, 6, so this also. is what I want to indicate to you. The first problem we have is this. But by the way, before you go, who's right, Ali or, or Jack Dio? And who should we listen to in no, terms of the numbers? Well, well, I don't think any, any two of them, I don't think any two of them is right, um, because both of them are trying to fudge numbers. But I want to come to it. Let, sure. let, me, let me take it. Sure. Let us assume that 264,000 is correct. Ali, in his address, said that $200,000 will be paid to households households okay now in the census everybody is counted whether you're a Guyanese a Venezuelan a Bangladeshi or what whoever is found at the house on the day on census day mm -hmm. everybody is counted so the two six to four thousand households have not been separated between Guyanese households and foreigners households that's the first problem you got. Mm -hmm. Because they later on said it is only to be paid to Guyanese households. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how many Guyanese households are there? It is not 264,000. 264,000 is the census households that includes foreigners. All the foreigners in Guyana are counted at that particular point. Bangladeshi, Sri Lankans, Jamaicans, you know, all the people working at the different international agencies and so on. They have households. They are counted on census day. So what is the figure for Guyanese households? Release the census report, please. That's where your 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 question now comes in. Because it, is, it, it will be less than 264. Yep. So let us assume, without any information, it's back to your 240. Exactly. And let us assume they're talking about 300,000 Guyanese households. Yep. So we have a difference now of roughly 60,000. Yep. 60,000 multiplied by 200,000 gives you $12, 12 billion. billion dollars. Yes. Where is this $12 billion? How is this $12 billion going to be? That's the question you want to ask. Exactly. How is this 12 billion? And how you, that's why I tell you about this New York position that they've come out with. No study done whatsoever. How you, even if you took the census two six or four thousand, could tell me now that you are budgeting for three hundred thousand? How did you come up with the thirty six thousand difference? Let us assume that two six or four thousand were indeed Guyanese households, which we know is false. Yeah. How did you come up with thirty six thousand? Why not fifty? Why not twenty eight? Why not ten? You, you understand what I'm saying? Yep. You have a huge problem. And then I saw him mumbling. I saw Jaguar mumbling something when I asked the question, what about, what about the 36,000? Well, you know, um, there's something about um, maybe they didn't count. They got, they got to go back and count some people and some people didn't count. You got to take a count of the squatters. How many squatters are there? Where are they located? Look, to avoid this problem that, that, that is inherent in this issue about households, they should step back and say, listen, be listening. They indeed got problems with this question about household. We are going to be given, as I suggested on Thursday morning on Cam's TV, $100,000 to Guyanese residents.
Guyanese adult Guyanese residents. That is easier. Because first of all, here's the advantages of doing that. One, you got a problem. You don't have to have a problem anymore about defining households. Because a lot of people think a house is a household. Is that true? A house is not a household. And you don't go around and say, well, look, I passed the house and so on. Or I, I finished with that house. You might finish with that house. But you don't, you have not finished with the households. In the building. In the building. Yeah. Because that's purely a physical structure called a house. But in that house, may be several households. But then again, what is the definition? What is the definition that the government is using for a household? You know, I mean, take this quick example. A son and, and his father. His father is aged. He's a pensioner. The son is renting from somebody else. Now you have two adults plus a landlord. Who's getting this 200000 However, if you go by individuals, those two people will get 100000 each. You're 200000 But if they have 10 adults in there, they'll get a million. And it will avoid the fractic side and every side that you will get about this 200000 in a household. Because which member of the household will receive the money? Correct. And how many members of the household will benefit from it? Well, don't worry the benefit part because all the government is interested in is paying giving, it. paying it to yeah. whoever is supposed to get it. Then the problem starts. The intercommunal problems going to start. The bickering, the biting, the, the, the backbiting, the backstabbing, you know, and even worse. Because when it comes to money, even families fall out. Right, him from his father. So you got this problem. The, the, the plus here, some of the pluses about giving it to individuals. The Working People's Alliance has welcomed the government's initiative of a one-off two hundred thousand dollars cash grant to every household. However, the party noted that short-term relief does very little overall for citizens who face various economic hardships. During the WPAS press conference on Monday, the party's leader Dr. David Hines said, while the WPA welcomes the initiative announced by the president as a baby step forward, we bemoan the fact that taken as a whole, they represent more of an election gimmickry rather than a genuine attempt to address the country's debilitating social and economic problems. The WPA believes that the initiative should be annual and be a percentage of revenues earned from oil and gas. It should be noted that currently oil is being produced from the Stabrook block, which is operating by Exxon Mobil Guyana Limited. Last year, Guyana earned $336 billion from oil. Dr. Hines argued that the relief provided by the measures announced last week by President Irfan Ali during his special address to the 12th Parliament would ultimately do little for the working class and the poor. He emphasized that Guyana needs a sustained, long-term socio-economic development plan rather than the temporary measures outlined by the President. Nowhere in the President's address, for example, did he frontally confront the persistent poverty that continues to take its toll on the populace. It is estimated that approximately 42% of Guyana live on less than 5.5 US dollars per day. He said, Dr. Hines continued, this is unacceptable in a country which boasts one of the highest GDP growths in the world. The WPA continues to believe that direct cash transfers to the citizens is one of the most potent ways to tackle these problems. Moreover, the WPA believes that the announcements are a clear example of political opportunism. It was stated that mounting pressures to address the skyrocketing cost of living and the widening gap between growth and development is what pushed the government to resort to the opposition's idea of cash transfer to citizens. While the cash transfer should be welcomed by Guyanese, especially the poor and the working poor, Guyanese should not be fooled. It is at best an undertaking that is potentially burdened with opportunities for corruption. Dr. Hines say, importantly, to ensure the cash transfer policy has a meaningful and lasting impact, the WPA proposed that it be linked directly to poverty alleviation efforts. The party leader suggested it must also benefit from a feasibility study to determine its scope and design. It must be grounded in law so that it is shielded from the whims and fancies of the political executive. The WPA generally welcomes the initiatives announced by the president as a baby step forward we bemoan the fact that taken as a whole, they represent more of an election gimmickry rather than a genuine attempt 
to address the country's debilitating social and economic problems. Although electioneering is part of political life, any responsible government should ground its stewardship of the country in a broader framework. The proposals represent a hodgepodge of items aimed at preying on a populace tired of economic frustration and looking for relief from any quarter. WPA feels that these short-term relief measures will in the final analysis do very little to bring about sustainable change in the economic fortunes of workers, families, and the poor. In this regard, WPA feels that Guyana urgently needs sustained socio-economic development plan. A sustained socio-economic development plan rather than mere temporary measures as outlined by the president. Nowhere in the president's address, for example, did he frontally confront the persistent poverty that continues to take its toll on the populace. It is estimated that approximately 42% of Guyanese live on less than 5.5 US dollars per day. This is unacceptable in a country which boasts one of the highest GDP growths in the world. The WPA continues to believe that direct cash transfers to the citizens is one of the most potent ways to tackle this problem. This problem. Towards this end, WPA takes note of the president's announcement of the 200,000 cash transfer to each household. We recall that when, Pre when Professor Clive Thomas first floated the idea in August 2018, Vice President Jack Deal said it was technically unsound and could not even be considered before 2030, if ever. Attorney General Nandlal said if implemented, cash transfers would destroy families and turn Guyanese into parasites. That the government has now embraced the idea, albeit in an unstructured, haphazard way, it is an admission of its own lack of economic foresight and paucity of ideas to meet the urgent needs of the new dispensation. In the end, WPA feels the announcement smacks of political opportunism. Nowhere in the world has there been genuine development based on opportunism. Facing mounting pressures to address the skyrocketing cost of living and the widening gap between growth and development, the government has resorted to ideas from the opposition without giving credit to the latter. This is crass politics at its best that cannot be sustained. While the cash transfer should be welcomed by Guyanese, especially the poor and the working poor, Guyanese should not be fooled. The government has embraced the form of the WPA's proposal, but rejects its essence. It is at best a haphazard undertaking that is potentially burdened with opportunities for corruption. First, the president gave no indica indication how the government arrived at the dollar amount. Second, it is a one-off payment rather than a structured, sustainable initiative with a stated outcome. Third, it is not clear what distributive mechanism would be used to ensure that all citizens benefit from it. Fourth, the government has not been forthcoming on its definition of households. WPA feels that a viable cash transfer policy 
must be linked to poverty alleviation. It must also benefit from a feasibility study to determine its scope and design. It must be grounded in law so that it is shielded from the whims and fancies of the political executive. It must specifically be a percentage of oil and gas revenues. Finally, it must be an ongoing government program rather than a haphazard government payout subject to partisan manipulation. WPA. President Dr. Arfan Ali on Monday inaugurated the newly reconstructed $346.2 million Northwest Secondary School in Region 1, marking a significant milestone in the region's education sector. The modern facility, which replaces the original school destroyed by a devastating arson attack in 2021, now boasts 20 spacious classrooms, three fully equipped science laboratories, and two modified lift classrooms for special needs education. This state-of-the-art institution is expected to serve 525 students from surrounding communities, providing them with enhanced educational opportunities to drive local and national development. The new school is also outfitted with two modified lift classrooms to deliver special needs education to vulnerable students. President Dr. Arfan Ali alongside Education Minister Priya Manik Chan and students for ribbon cutting. The school was constructed by Aruka Investment. Catchment areas benefiting from the secondary school include Hatakwai, Yarakita, Matthews Ridge Sebai, Red Hill, Howie Kuro, Warner, Wanena, Kamwata Whitewater, Habodia, Sun. Johns, Kachikamo, St. Cyprian's, Barrison, Blackwater, Savannah, St. Margaret's, Thomas Hill, Mabaruma Sediment, Mabaruma Township, Mabaruma Compound, Kanaka, Barbina, Hasororo, Wayne, Whitewater, Yarikita, Powikiru, Arkansas, Habodia, Hatakwa, Red Hill, and St. Anson's. In his address, President Ali revealed that the school will be a transformational force, both at the individual and community levels, by upskilling 525 students with the scientific expertise needed to expand Diana's economy. We are not stopping at this, we want to ensure that every teacher in the hinterland must have the ability to become a trained teacher from right where you teach. And every teacher in the hinterland who is a trained teacher must have the opportunity to become a trained graduate from right where you teach. So, it's not only the investment in increases in ROI and increases in salaries and benefits, it's investment in your personal welfare, it's investment in making you more competent, it's investment in making you more valuable, it's investment in making you more competitive, it's investment with a human face and these are investments that are important for us, the head of state disclosed. Meanwhile, Education Minister Priya Manik Chan announced the expansion of the school in 2025. Infrastructure works will include the construction of a multi-purpose court for sporting activities, dorms and a kitchen. We were going to put a shed aside in the school that would be a more purposeful one for assemblies and graduations and so on. But now that I see this one, I'm kind of liking this a lot. And I'm thinking that at the side of the school, we'll put a multi-purpose court where your children can play various types of sports and we'll get the region to build a shed right here here that allows for assemblies and graduations and so on. So, this is not the end of us. This is a good indication that we love you, but it's not the end of us. I promise you that whatever we say we will say to you, you will get that and more through the Ministry of Education, through the Ministry of Housing and what? Through the Ministry of Local Government, through the Ministry of Amerindian and Affairs, all of us coming at you all the time, the Minister said. On September 24, 2021, the Northwest Secondary School was destroyed by fire which the Guyana Fire Service had ruled as an act of arson. In a scathing critique, human rights activist Lurley Nestor has denounced the recent actions of Guyana's Minister of Education, Priya Manik Chan, calling them an egregious breach of privacy and an example of reckless leadership. Nestor's fiery remarks come after Minister Manik Chen published what appears to be internal ministry records on her social media page, revealing the names and birthdates of teachers eligible for duty-free concessions on vehicles, sparking outrage. Nestor did not hold back in her criticism, describing the minister's actions as unethical, lawless, unconscionable, classless, unprofessional, ignorant, undignified, uncaring, indecent, disrespectful, insensitive, anti-privacy, and downright vulgar. She argued that such behavior should not be normalized and condemned the public display of personal information, which she said reflected a lack of regard for the dignity of teachers. This is not normal and it should never be normalized, Nesta declared. 
for the Minister of Education to publish the names and dates of birth of teachers on social media is beyond comprehension. This is someone who is supposed to be the nation's guardian of education, yet this display of vulgarity raises serious questions about leadership in this country. The document in question, which was captioned duty-free concession for teachers 52 and over, has raised concerns not only about the privacy of teachers but also about the broader implications of the policy itself. Nestor questioned whether teachers had given their consent for their personal information to be made public in the name of duty-free concessions, and whether such a practice reflected a deeper disregard for the profession. The dignity of teachers should not be attacked and exploited to massage the ego of their boss or to gain political mileage, she said. Did teachers consent to their personal information being splashed across social media? Did they agree to this blatant violation? It's beyond unfortunate that such demeaning acts by the minister seem to be becoming normalized. Nestor went further to criticize the policy that ties the duty-free concession to teachers' age, calling it divisive and discriminatory. She argued that younger teachers, who may also have financial needs, are effectively being told to wait your age. What do you say to a young teacher? Wait until you're 52. Why should they have to wait until they are only three years away from retirement to benefit from this concession? The policy lacks empathy, it lacks care, and it's utterly brainless in its construction. It is a shameful reflection of anti-progressive thinking in the education system. Her remarks underscored what she sees as a growing trend of ignorance and insensitivity being normalized by people in positions of power. This type of ignorance is being normalized, even by those who should know better. That's how societies degrade, Nessa lamented. Nesta made it clear that she would not further amplify the minister's post by sharing its content, which she said would only serve to reinforce the disregard for privacy and respect for teachers. As the controversy continues to swirl, many are left wondering whether Minister Manikchin will respond to Nestor's powerful words and whether any action will be taken to address what Nestor has called a shameful episode. For now, the situation remains a flashpoint in the ongoing debate about privacy, leadership, and respect for the teaching profession in Guyana. Plaintiff points to Granger, Ramjitin when asked about AP and U plus AFC's refusal to leave office after 2018, alleged Russian interference in 2020 elections, admits her claims against Jagdio stemmed from a 14-second clip of full press conference on TikTok. Catherine Caffey used face a rigorous cross-examination in her defamation case against Vice President Barrett Jadio over his alleged low-life comment, with questions focusing on the Partnership for National Unity Plus Alliance for Change's refusal to leave office after being toppled by a no-confidence motion in 2018, and concerns about alleged Russian interference in the 2020 elections. The trial continued on Monday before Justice Priscilla Chunderhanif at the High Court in Demerara. Hughes, a prominent member of the opposition party, AFC, initiated legal action against Vice President Jagdeel following comments during one of his weekly press conferences on November 23, 2023, in which he allegedly referred to her as a low light. During Monday's session, Hughes faced a series of questions aimed at further testing her credibility. For instance, she was questioned by Jagdeel's attorney Sanji dated and concerning a statement she made at a press conference regarding the 2020 general and regional elections. In that statement, dated and said that Hughes had asserted that Russians were in Guyana to hijack the elections. When asked if she had made the statement, Hughes responded, those were not my exact words. A recording of Hughes making the statement was played by Jagdio during his November 23, 2023 press conference. In court, the portion of Jagdio playing the recording at the press conference was presented. Hughes then admitted that she had received information about four individuals, including two Russians, who were staying at a prominent hotel and were in possession of questionable surveillance equipment. She said that these individuals were in the country without proper authorization. When dated and asked if anyone had been deported, she responded, I think it was four. Yindan Mia Sharma Solomon has called for the immediate closure of the uncapped New Jeddak Access Road in view of concerns over new findings of unsafe levels of arsenic, zinc, nickel, and chromium there. At the statutory meeting of the Linden Mayor and Town Council on September 4, 2024, Town Clerk Lennox Gasper was tasked with sending correspondence to Minister of Public Works Juan Edville to make him aware of this. This was not done. Gasper is on record saying, correspondence was not sent, however, I did engage the minister. Minister Edville denied this before a meeting with stakeholders on October 12th. 2024. Let me be clear, this is the first time I'm hearing of this. So nobody could say I knew about it and didn't respond, Edgar said. 
The Department of Public Information last night issued a press release in which it claimed that Stabroke News had misreported statements by Minister of Foreign Affairs Hugh Todd on Venezuelan migrants in Linden. To the contrary, Stabroke News accurately reported the minister's remarks and the newspaper stands by its story. Stabroke News editor-in-chief Annan Persaud said that the author of the DPI press release appears completely at sea on the details of the matter. DPI said that Minister Todd wished to clarify from the outset that his conversation with the Stabroke News reporter on October 10th at Parliament was always cordial. DPI said it culminated with her acknowledging that the report the minister was referring to, which was not written by her, was indeed plagued with misinformation that needed to be flagged with the editor-in-chief. Persaud said that the reporter never said that that report was plagued with misinformation but simply said it hadn't been written by her. Furthermore, he said that Todd behaved obstreperously towards the reporter and shouted at her in Parliament in a most unprofessional display. At issue, DPI said was the minister's observation that though he had earlier given an interview to the reporter, the story which was purportedly causing unease was in fact written by someone else and omitted the vast majority of information the minister had provided during the interview. The SNIC said that Todd's statements on the situation of the migrants in Linden had been adequately covered by the reporter and no one else had written anything on what he had said. Persaud said that another report appeared in the Sunday Stabroke of October 12th reporting further remarks that Todd had made about the situation in Linden and addressing his behavior in Parliament. So many of you might have noticed my absence from this page over the past week. Well dot 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 my page got restricted for seven days, thanks to a spurious claim by Ms. Stacey Rahman of Visit Guyana. Two Fridays ago during the final weekend of CPL in Guyana, the Guyana Tourism Authority reached out to me to post a paid promotional video on my page for Destination Guyana featuring actor Jacob Scipio. The Guyana Tourism Authority had commissioned well-known photographer and film producer John Green to shoot, document and produce a video. The video was well produced and had received the all clear from the actor and his team, so there was no issue with posting it, and so I posted. Moments after the posting of the video on this page, it went viral and amassed more than 100,000 views within the first 24 HRS. The views and shares kept growing. I was busy with news source work and following the CPL that weekend in addition to fighting off the flu. All seemed well, until last Monday morning when I got up and attempted to make the usual good morning posts and realized that my page had been restricted. I was confused because I did not know of making any posts or comment that was against any Facebook policy, and so I quickly raised the issue with the Facebook reporting mechanism. To my surprise, I was informed by the FB team that a copyright infringement had been flagged against the same video I had posted that was supplied by the Tourism Authority. The video was an original work by John Green so this left me confused. However, in digging more, FB sent me the name of the complaining party. The name was Zach Scipio, who is the brother of the actor. At the moment, I was thinking why would he have an objection to the video, but as I scrolled down, the reporting email address was not that of Zach Scipio, but rather the email address belonging to to Ms. Raham in a visit Guyana. I recognized her name in the address and the address itself from previous emails. I alerted the tourism authority and the film producer to the issue and they were confused as they were shocked over what had taken place since she was laying claim to the video that she had not commissioned or produced and a video that the actor had no issue with. They were apologetic and offered to probe the matter. Dot, 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 my page was still restricted. Later that morning, I received a phone call from Ms. Rahaman, admitting that she had filed a complaint against the video but did not know it would have affected my page and also offering an apology and promising to withdraw her complaint. She apparently filed the complaint because she had not seen the video first and claimed that the young man's team had some issue with some clips in the video dot 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 that turned out to be untrue. They had no issues with the video. And while Ms. Rahaman played a role with the tourism authority in the actor's visit, they certainly did not hand over their rights to her, and she certainly had no rights to the video or its production. What I found strange in all of this was that Ms. Rahaman knows me and knows how to reach me, and so if there was an issue with the video, she could have reached out to me and chose not to dot 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 and further. She was among the long list of persons offering comments under the same video on my page and none of those comments had any issue with the posting of the video on my page. In fact, for every comment where someone bigged her up for the role she played in the actor's visit, she was right there accepting that big up with a reply. I also took note that although the same video was sent to other media entities and personalities including Newsroom and they also posted, the complaint was only filed against the video post on my page dot 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 and not any of the others. It would appear as though she might have had an issue with some of the comments that thanked the producer for not having her in the spotlight in the video and her brand not being mentioned in the video. 
not one of those things had anything to do with me. She did keep her promise to withdraw the claim, but by the time that went through, the restriction was already into day four, and so I just had to wait until FB released the restriction automatically this morning. Stacy and her team does good work in promoting Guyana, but she must understand by now that it is not about her, and she needs to ease herself gently off that self-importance high that she has been riding on and just do the work and move on. The funny thing is, when she started Visit Guyana, I was one of the first persons to promote her work through my page and even my radio program and when the clause often came out on social media against her, I never got myself involved in that craziness and even defended her work at times dot 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 but so it go. Do better Stacy and relax yourself. Let me say thanks to all the folks who reached out in my inbox after noticing my absence to see if I was okay dot 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 lol dot 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 at one point I even had to check on me with the amount of people who were checking on me. This lady probably through her uh, visit Guyana, some organization, whatever it is, uh, decided that she's going to invite certain people to Guyana. And so she decided uh, to invite this guy who star in some movies called Bad Boys or something like that. Uh, bad boys, right? You guys know the whole thing. You can let us know, discuss it in the audio. Bad boy, right? Um, bad boys, some movie. And so through her organization, she brought him to Guyana. And so uh, she brought him to Guyana. Uh, she believed that she should be in control of his movement. So members of the PPP, and I want you guys to listen carefully, right? And this is this is where this is where I say to Stacy, uh, to the PPP, good for the PPP, good for them. The PPP deserves everything that Stacy is doing to them. And here is why. Here is what I'm going to tell you. This. So it's obvious that Stacy invited. Wait, is how 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 this guy hogging Stacy? Anyway, sorry about that. Let me pay attention to this show, <laughs> right? Sorry about that, guys. I must apologize. So Stacy invited uh, her organization, invited this guy, and she got through. Big time she got through, right? To have this guy in Guyana. So as he got into Guyana, and you know, Stacy got to do your thing. His name is Jacob Sapio. And uh, this is what this is what uh this was on october 5th says he was saying actor jacob Scipio last visit to guyana recapping his emotional journey back to his ancestral home and this is stacy interviewing him stacy don't make joke you know stacy interviewing him stacy went um where, where they went they went kaicho falls together all over stacy and the and then the ppp regime wanted a cut of this too they wanted a piece of the action. Priya Manikchan wanted a piece of the action too. And so Priya Manikchan got involved. She saw this opportunity and guess what she did? She ensured that she got a cut. She wanted a cut out of this thing. She ain't going to allow this actor. I am almost certain she never knew him from Jump Street. I am almost certain she never watched the movie. She doesn't know this guy from Jump Street. But there is something that's so captivating about this guy that drew him to Priya Manik Chan and caught Priya Manik Chan's attention. Priya Manik Chan decided that she is she has other purposes for this guy. She wants him to uh, do something on the part of the Ministry of Education. And so in doing so, she invited him to QC to talk to the students of which 95 percent of them i am almost certain never watched the movie doesn't know this guy but it's a good inspirational story that a guyanese guy got his uh thing in a uh, in a quote in a what is it um uh, a movie to talk about humble beginning his father's uh homeland which is good and again i am not knocking this actor at all at all this has nothing to do with any personal thing against the actor I got to watch the movie, though, to see what role he played. But Priya wanted a piece of the action because Priya was adamant that Stacy cannot get all the show. Stacy is not going to steal this show. They want a piece of the action. So in order to get a piece of the action, Stacy probably had to get some. They got to spend their money. They got to spend taxpayers money. And so Stacy decided that if they got to spend taxpayers' monies so that this actor can travel around and do whatever, now you can't blame Stacy for that. It's taxpayers' money. 
and the PPP wanted full control of this guy. And Stacy in having none of that because Stacy was like, no, 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 no. You can't do that. She ain't giving up. She ain't giving up the mountain. She ain't giving up Jacob. So no matter how much they try, and all of them tried, Oneid tried, Priya Manikchan tried, all of them tried. And this is what this is what Priya Manikchan said actually. Uh, Yesterday, meaning uh, September 27th, it would have been September 26th. Yesterday, the Ministry of Education exposed high school children to Jacob Supio. Supio, right? Very pleased. Priya is saying very pleased to say he is not just a pretty face. Oh, y'all see where this is coming from, right? He is not just a pretty face. No, 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 no. Pretty face and bad character. Them not kind of living on a, mm, all right. So we get where Priya and them are coming from. So what attracted Priya to this guy is the pretty face. And so she wanted to just let us know that, look, look, it's not just about the pretty face, but we know it's about the pretty face. She says now, he was great. Holy smoke. You go, Priya, girl. He was great. And there it is, Priya, at... Um, Queen's College, dear, looking at the pretty face. Oh, I am almost good at reading body language and face ex facial expression and so forth. What a pretty face. Okay, so we now get a good idea as to what this fight is all about. We now get it. And so some of you jumping down, Stacy. Oh, Stacy, this, they can't stand Stacy. Now, uh, maybe some of you may have reasons for that. Now, I don't follow Stacey. I don't know her that well. I don't know what this, but I've seen her trending at times and Stacey don't make joke for the ancient picture, you know. I want Stacey there in a picture right behind me here, right next to me and take a selfie. Stacey is good at those sort of things. She markets herself. She markets her brand. And maybe that is what it's all about too. But when it comes to this guy here now, there seem to be a big fight. A big fight over the man. A big fight. They're fighting over the man. Who paid money for him? Who? Let's take a quick break. I don't want to wrong talk. I can't take it no more. I can't take it no more. Can't take it no more. Imagine 18 hours of blackout. And you're telling people progress. Cause the living on up 100%. Get your give public servant less. Mr. President, listen to the people. Okay, sorry about that. So <laughs> we've got to be back again now. Look. And uh, and so they're fighting, they're fighting over this actor. Look, I will tell you this. If I were to interview Priya Manik Chan right now, I would ask her if she ever saw the movie, if she knows this guy. And I'm almost certain that her response is going to be no. The last, the only movie probably Priya would watch and probably would say that she can talk is from the movie uh, Kayama Se Kayama Kat with Amir Khan. And that song in that movie, she probably remembers it word for word. Papa Kitare Baranamo Karega, Beta Hamada, Haisakamo Karega, Makadeye Do, Kohi Najani. Hi, Priya. How are you? How come Priya doesn't look at us like that in Guyana? <laughs> no, I'm not jealous of Supio. Uh, but according to Priya Manichan, he has a pretty face. So that is what this fight is all about, guys. That is what it's all about control. And so um, this woman, Stacy Rahman, in giving up on, she, on the guy she brought to Guyana and, and the brother. And so look at what look at what Stacy wants to be in every everything you see Stacy Stacy's all over Stacy Stacy and the guy I saw interviews with Stacy and the guy and it was a pretty close sub interview uh, and so that's okay we're all adults me and Kev, I don't mind people business but she apparently apparently the the fight now is who give who give money that's the fight who give money and according according to these folks um onage waldron is saying that they provided money to stacy and therefore stacy got to be all these sort of things so they're fighting they're fight, fighting over there they felt 
They felt that they were wrong by Stacy because they gave Stacy money to promote this guy. That's the allegation that they gave Stacy money and Stacy in giving them no blind, so to speak. Good for them. I don't blame Stacy. Good for them. They give people money, uh, just like they're doing with these guys. They're rounding up. Uh, hi, doggy. Hi, guys. They're rounding them up and they're giving them money in the name of contracts and these sort of things. And they feel that they own them. And Stacy in taking the Stacy said, Y'all didn't give me none. I am the one that did all the hard work. So Stacy went out there, probably went out, whatever it is, to get the guy to Guyana. And you telling me on age and all they want to steal the woman's thunder? Look, man, some of you on social media might be attacking Stacy and saying that you have you have every right to do so. But on this note, I say good for the PPP. Good for Onage Waldron, good for Priya Manik Chan and them. It's good for them. Um, Stacy did them exactly what they have been doing to people. Uh, Stacy probably take the taxpayers' money, uh, do what she gotta do, and go on your way. Y'all don't be too... Whitford Bark breaking news. Statement by Diana Police Commissioner admitted he accepted $8.5 million from a businessman to pay for his colleague's wedding surfaces. A statement on the Diana Police Commissioner's letter has surfaced, with what appears to be the signature of Police Commissioner Clifton Hicken admitting that he accepted $8,500 in cash to pay for the November 11, 2023 Pegasus wedding reception of Assistant Commissioner Calvin Brutus. CGID has the statement. The letter appeared days after Assistant Commissioner Fazel Karnmach, who heads the Special Organized Crime Unit, issued an official statement denying that he can submitted such a statement to his unit. Every day the Guyanese public is being treated to a spectacle of corruption and dishonesty emanating from the Diana police force. Diana Daily News, which has emerged as the publicist for PPP East Indian officers in the Diana police force posted the below statement on Sunday, October 12, 2024. SOCU refutes Stabrook News article on investigation of senior cop. Head of the Special Organized Crime Unit, Assistant Commissioner of Police Fazul Karambach is refuting an article published in today's Sunday Stabrope News date October 13, 2024 under the headline Top Cop told SOCU he accepted envelope with $8.50 M from businessmen to finance Brutus wedding. The article alleges that Top Cop Clifton Hicken submitted a statement to the investigators acknowledging that he collected an envelope with $8.50 and in cash from a businessman to offset the cost of Brutus's wedding at the Pegasus Suites Atlantic Conference Center. SOCU would like to place on record that the ongoing investigation has no such statement from Hicken, and that no such statement about Hicken exists in the file. Karen Mask is calling on media houses to be responsible when reporting on matters that are of sensitive nature. Having denied that this letter exists, Clifton Hicken and Karen Mask must explain where this statement is and to whom it was submitted. Eight Butterfly Sea Moss Powder Take your daily routine to the next level natural vegan superfood powder essential multivitamin powder made just for you mm -mm. So yeah my a couple morning ago critics come on the live oh we found the culprit we know who given you know it's called me smelly smell we know who given smelly smell her information on this government could you believe the traitor is one of the own just because he wants to be president and this and the and critics come on the live y'all know it's nandalal they say giving me poor nandalal anyway y'all kill nandalal me really kill. <laughs> hello yes is he nandalal tell them is you give me the secrets yes yes is nandalal y'all please how lying cathy use is she presents this veneer of sophistication and and that she did all of this work zero work she still she still has not answered why she refused after the the bill was passed to liberalize telecommunication in and they promised the liberalization of tele telecommunication in their manifesto why she didn't sign the order